Hello, everyone. Excited to be here. Um, and when I'm not volunteering for the CFA Society, I work at a Boston-based blockchain startup. So I've been dabbling in the fintech space for a couple of years now and super excited to bring fintech programming to the CFA Boston members. And with that, I want to kick off today's session. We have two industry veterans with us here um, who've seen various aspects from like the growth of fintech when fintech was just this like side thing that a lot of companies did to now fintech being like Know, the industry, um, the hot space to be in. Um, with that, our first panelist today is Sarah, Sarah Biller. Um, she's the executive director of Vantage Ventures. She's also the co-founder of Fintech Sandbox. Um, Fintech Sandbox is a Boston-based nonprofit that provides entrepreneurs access to high quality data sets and accelerates the adoption of innovative ideas and financial services. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, Fintech Sandbox and if you're interested in Fintech, definitely recommend checking it out. They do a lot of interesting Fintech related events um, and support the Fintech community in Boston. Welcome Zara, excited to have you here. Um, and then our second panelist today is Mark Cassidy. Um, Mark co-founded Vestigo Ventures in 2015, um, and that's focused on financing startups in the fintech space. But before that, he was a former member of FINRA, um, Board of Governors, and also he retired as the LPL Financial CEO uh, early in January 2017. Um, and right now, um, and he was also the non-executive chairman of the board um, at LPL Financial. So welcome, Mark, um, to this panel. Thank you. Uh, you know, I didn't do a great job of describing your bios or giving a good introduction because there's just so much you've done in the past. So I would also love to hear a little bit from your perspective, just to tell our, um, you know, people who have joined today, you know, your background and your journey through the FinTech space. Mark. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Always, Mark and I are old friends, so it's kind of I kind of kind of guess ladies first with Mark. He's All such right. a gentleman, as as well as deeply talented. <laughs> Um, so just very quickly, Manasseh, just to add just a little color um, to, to what you shared, and I appreciated so much your call out for the FinTech Sandbox and our, our labor of love and really helping to advance innovation um, in, in financial services and, and do it in a way that's enterprise ready as well as a principled approach. Um, the FinTech Sandbox is actually a wonderful uh, moment for me as a professional in financial services. Um, I was at Fidelity, had started um, my own fintech company in the, in the wake of the credit crisis, and it centered on looking for non-financial factors that were driving near-term credit spreads um, and applying a Bayesian estimation technique um, to those factors once we quantified them to predict um, to predict risk, both uh, contraction uh, as well as widening of, of spreads. And what we found was, was that we could not act, easily access data. And I think that's one of the themes we might pull out today are the tools that are in place um, that are both uh, maturing as well as emerging uh, for the application of data um, to capital markets professionals lives. But in addition to founding my own company, I was also the chief operating officer for innovation at State Street, um, met some of my dearest friends there and had a wonderful experience um, as well as taught at Brandeis where I uh, had a chance actually to inter interact with Mark's daughter, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is the world is so small, FinTech, all roads bring back. But um, I taught in the master's program, uh, the, four, the first graduate program that conferred a degree for FinTech um, around the evolution of financial services. So I guess all of that being said, again, thank you for having me. I hope to bring all those perspectives today. But Mark. Yeah, let me, let me uh, add my background. And it is always fun to be on a panels there together. <laughs> We've spent uh, a lot of time thinking about the space. My career has been around financial services for a long time. I, I hate to say it, but it's about 40 years. <laughs> um, and it's always been in, in a company that really is trying to take technology and do something different with it either democratizing access to products or to capabilities, um, you know, which is a big, big piece of bringing the cost curve down, uh, or using technology to really advance its own um, you know, state of play, <clears throat> you know, be more effective at what they do, being less expensive, whatever else it might be. So it's always been fascinating to me how technology does change the industry. Um, and I would say in my 40 years experience in financial services, 
this is probably the most exciting time I've ever seen because we're seeing the advent of really different technologies, new and exciting ones like advanced AI, blockchain like you're in, um, and many others <clears throat> that are essentially changing uh, the industry as much as I've ever seen it change. Um, and it needs to, it needs to drive its cost curve down. It needs to delight clients. There's all sorts of, of themes that need to make its way through. But for anybody, uh, however you're involved in the industry, it's probably as exciting a time as any of I've ever seen uh, mm -hmm. for bringing change and really making the industry even more effective than it has been. And that's what led us to found Vestigo Ventures was to essentially really support uh, early stage startups at the seed stage through the A <clears throat> on their journey. Uh, of forming a company, you know, figuring out the market fit, figuring out pricing, and then hopefully launching into a, a bigger company after that. Uh, we just finished fund uh, one in terms of our investment uh, cycle there, and we're now on to fund two. We have 20 companies in fund one, and we'll have the same number in, in fund two. So it's a, an exciting time in, in Boston in particular, uh, and I think a very exciting time in fintech. Yeah, I definitely want to dig into a lot that you said, Mark, um, about the advent of technology and how the landscape is changing. Um, but before that, I did want to do a quick poll from the audience. Um, so if Gary or Ka Caitlin, if you can launch that poll, just trying to understand, um, you know, how many of you currently work in the fintech industry. Always tempted to have those little songs play. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> it's a 60 second poll, so it should be over pretty quickly. We need our own FinTech Jeopardy moment. We yeah. do, don't we? I don't know the theme song or an anthem yet, do you? <laughs> yeah. Great one. Oh. And as we kind of close off this poll, I, from you know, Sarah, I do want to hear more about Vantage Ventures as well. Um, okay, we have the results. Majority of the people, 86% said, no, they don't work in the fintech space. That's amazing. I'm glad you are here to learn more about what that space looks like and how it's evolved. Um, thank you for answering the four questions. So Sarah, yeah, do want to hear more about Vantage Ventures, what do you do there? I know there's some, couple of new interesting deals that you did recently. Um, tell us more. Yeah, can I make a comment about the poll though first? I think both yeah. of you would be tickled by my comment because I, I do start um, my, uh, my, when I'm teaching, when I'm lecturing with this point that actually um, financial services and the intersection of technology actually shows up in the Old Testament. It's about 2000 years old. For those of you who think you aren't in fintech, <laughs> Um, the reality is, is that financial services, um, probably of all of the general, you know, large industry classifications, have been rapid adopters of the fintech of the day, if you will, the tech of the day, whether that's sort of the idea that we actually see it show up in the way that, you know, the Babylonians, when they were etching on the stones, mm -hmm. we know the earliest forms of writing were actually to record transactions, you know, and so you see this evolution, you think about the advent of double, you know, double book accounting from the Medici's. So sorry to add that little thing in, but I'm so, I'm so glad that like we have a moment to say that even if you don't consider yourselves working in fintech, you, you probably know more than you think you do about that emerging and adoption of new technologies because of the industry and the way that it advances so rapidly. So anyway, that's my little plug that everybody on here actually is Good. in fintech. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Manassi, real quick on Vantage, I think one of the things that um, we do have to, you know, think about too as financial services um, professionals is this extensibility of how do you actually reach into new categories, adjacent markets, underserved um, uh, communities. And so we, I launched Vantage Ventures um, about a year now ago, just over a year with John Chambers from Cisco Systems to really contemplate the mobility of money. Can we drive outcomes in the entrepreneurial community? Um, what would it take really to create, you know, sort of in the center of the country, a movement um, towards entrepreneurship and a, and a different um, vibrancy in the economies? And we were, became industry agnostic, although we did just pass a fintech sandbox legislation in an all the state of West Virginia. <laughs> if anyone wants to know why, what West Virginia has to do with financial services, we could talk later. 
But Manassi, thank you for calling it out. We did just finish a significant partnership and investment in Virgin Hyperloop. Um, Virgin Hyperloop is, as you all may uh, imagine, it's Richard Branson's, uh, the company partnered with Richard Branson to develop a transportation system to move people and goods um, at 700 miles per hour on the ground, like a rocket ship, the terrestrial space race we're in. And so if you contemplate what that means to our day jobs and financial services, it will affect the way that commerce is conducted, the way that we risk and the way we price risk and supply chains, um, the way that we rethink um, the way, you know, we might finance new transportation, new energy. Um, we hope it opens up a whole new category, but we're super psyched. And I can't wait for all of us to be able to be together again in a generalized public transportation moment. <laughs> <laughs> Zipping down in this case, if we if we get it right to New York from Boston in about 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, can I wait to travel between New York and Boston in 20 minutes? <laughs> right? That that yeah. would be amazing. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you for that background. So you know, from your stories, it sounds like you've you've been in that operator more where you've worked at companies, you've founded companies, you've been CEOs of like financial um in you know companies in the financial services and fintech space. And then now you've moved on to this like investor kind of role, um, you know, at both at, uh, you know, Vantage and, you know, my QR company. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the investment landscape, um, you know, how that has also evolved, you know, looking backwards 10 years, what are the kind of hot topics in the fintech space you were looking at at investing versus now how that has kind of changed with you know the pandemic and the lockdown and everyone having to go online and you know moving from this like retail or in-person space to online space um yeah definitely love to hear more on that yeah i i think mark this is really i i roll up my sleeves mark is one of the most admired investors in the entrepreneurial community so mark i just really think this is where you start us. Yeah. Well, thanks. So I, I think that what we're seeing is is this advent of, you know, again, advanced AI, as I mentioned before, that to me is truly revolutionary. And you know, we sort of read the sensational press of it. It's going to replace everyone's job. And I think we need to get beyond that hype and think about it in terms of how it removes the mundane activities that have to be done and really completely changes the cost curve. We made an investment in fund two in a company called Roots Automation that I just love because they have these essentially bots that go in to do claims processes for insurance companies. And they basically will do up to eight times a human's amount of work of productivity, and then they shut off. They won't do more <laughs> because then you have to order the second one right from them. So I love that design right from a startup standpoint. Uh, but what's really special about it is these are such real interactions to the employees who are human that they actually give this bot a name, they give it an ID card, uh, and they essentially give it a birthday so they can you know, interact with it as if it were a, a coworker, um, which tells you an awful lot about how far AI is advancing. Um, and we see that in a lot of areas. So to me, that's the most interesting current you know, technology that's there. Uh, blockchain is absolutely fascinating, but tends to work uh, not quite so well in the venture world, uh, it works really well in a consortium world where we're all banks and we need to get something done together. And a blockchain is a really great solution for that. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a way to do it. We've seen a number of them, probably 50 or so uh, in the commercial space, but just haven't been able to find quite as much in that space as we'd like. I, I think it may happen more so in fund two as the blockchain has uh, matured. Um, and in fund one, it's really been about this advanced AI for the most part. 10 years ago, really more basic, not quite uh, clay, clay tablets, but, but, but more basic technologies <laughs> in terms of, of you know, how you're thinking about automation. So it would have been essentially process automation, customer journeys, uh, mm -hmm. operational uh, quality work. It was all part of, of what people were thinking about. Uh, and essentially just thinking about reducing waste within you know, an existing system uh, and some basic application of technologies that were you know, popular at the time. Uh, so widespread use of technology always in financial services because there's enormous amounts of data um, and, and so forth. But the tools even 10 years ago were still mainframes. Um, we can't forget how rapidly we've evolved you know, into a server world and how rapidly we've evolved into a cloud. I'll just give one last example is that about 12 years ago, invested in a hedge fund here in Boston that was taking signals from the environment um, and you know, FinTech Sandbox was an incredible partner to them in the early days. 
uh, they were able to find signals for trading and actually created a return in the portfolio is what they were after um, and away they went. Unfortunately, they ran into 2008, but, but that's a different story. <laughs> but the, it's still the technology worked. <laughs> that was the important message. Um, but what was interesting about it was their biggest cost and what the, the uh, venture funding had to go to was hardware. And they literally had a row of servers laid out in their office that heated up the entire building so much that the uh, landlord complained <laughs> that they were you know, essentially ruining the heating and cooling system. I mean, you can't even imagine that today, right? Because all that would be on the cloud. And instead of being the biggest expense, it would tend to be you know, towards the bottom of the list of expenses for a startup. So just think about that one innovation going to the cloud from a server field or a mainframe uh, it was an enormous boost to fintech and to entrepreneurial, you know, ideas. Yeah, and I think that's the problem now with mining rigs creating a lot of heat um, and using a lot of electricity. So, you know, yeah. that kind of resonated with me. But and before I move to Sarah, I would also want to hear, you know, the future. So, you know, how the pandemic has changed things. Are you seeing a shift in, you know, some of these startups that you're looking at, or it's, you know, just a continuing trend from the last ten years? I think I think as you think about where it's going and and you know how it, it works today is you know you there's just so many opportunities right to apply technology to um, you know essentially old problems right at the end of the day we just do a few things in financial services we pass risk around <laughs> we basically process transactions right and we report information um, and you can sum up banking you know insurance uh, and others pretty much by those. Uh, you know, activities we do. And so the question is what technologies apply to it in a way that make it better. And what the pandemic shown is that, you know, we were ready because of the cloud and because of tools like the one we're on here with Zoom, uh, much more ready than we realized to switch to this virtual world um, and forced, you know, uh, use of, uh, you know, direct commerce, for example, um, online ordering and those things from a 10% market share to what I think 20 or 22 percent uh, market share, um, you know, that's there, and, and much higher, I'm sure, in food services. So, long story short, is it just sort of pushed along, you know, what some would say as much as a decade's worth of human behavior into about, you know, what'll be hopefully just about a year and a half. That's only a good thing um, in terms of making things better, faster, cheaper. One of the things I reflected on is I used to travel about four days of work uh, a week when I worked for LPL Financial. I now look back and go, why did I do that? <laughs> I could, but of course, you know, even four years ago, Zoom didn't exist and, and you couldn't really, you know, it was not uh, okay to show up uh, virtually as opposed to showing up in person. It, it'll be so much different going forward uh, and so much more effective. I think you know everyone's ready to be back in office. I don't particularly predict, for example, a, a massive commercial real estate bust. I think people need people, right? And we need to be around each other. Uh, so I think we'll we'll probably go back to some pretty familiar patterns of going out to dinner and having a drink and seeing friends in the office and those things. It's just that we'll have a more flexible system. So we don't need to do that five days a week. We can do that three days a week and, and be quite happy. Uh, but we have proven the technology works. So for me, it was a massive proof point uh, of what this virtual world could be like. Yeah, and definitely it expands the resource and labor pool. Um, now you can access, you know, people from around the world or at least around the country um, working remotely. Um, yeah, Sarah, I want to hear, you know, your perspective on this. Yeah, I love, Mark, what you just you brought to light, which your investment in roots. It made me smile because, you know, where we've come from the NASI, and it's even, it's more than the last decade, but it's actually, you know, it's the last, if you will, almost, uh, quarter of a century, you think about Barclays, they introduced the first automated teller machine, ATM, in 1953. That's and they point. did that, right? Because they intended to actually have, you know, no one had to walk into a physical location and bank. And we are just now, as Mark just said, really, we've seen this last like year and a half accelerate our desire. Now we're doing it over the internet, but the point is still made, right? How do we create a, a frictionless digital environment that we trust and that we use 
and that it, you know we provision our financial services um, over different means of communication as opposed to truly that idea of bricks and mortar, um, which has obviously been under debate for probably the past, past decade. Um, and then also just to tag on to Mark's really astute observation, we have, we have entered into the maturation phase of a lot of these emerging technologies that we historically, you know, we've talked about for a long time, artificial intelligence. It now has a use case that's been proven out time and time again. Um, it's, it is in the business. It's being applied. I'd say people who are listening in are seeing it in their own work, whether it's from what Mark, Mark talked about in the back office, making it more, um, more efficient, right, to do just sort of rote processing all the way through to where we see the application of AI and trading environments. So that maturation leads me to like, what does the future hold for us? And some of the intersections that I think are super exciting and, and investable. And they have to do with a category of embedded finance. And that's where we see the application of technology um, around financial services reaching into other industries. And I think what that's doing is, is it's throwing off a whole other host of new insights about investable categories. Um, for those of you who follow the markets, I watched with great interest Royalty Pharma IPO this year. Royalty Pharma has developed a deep computational capability to better strike a price around an option on R&D development in life sciences. They're playing out that thesis that the capital markets could more quickly if it knew where to categorically put capital to solve cancer, mm. right? To disintermediate, but use the basic tenets of, you know, financial theory meets technology meets big data. So I'm really excited about where we're heading in the future. Manassi, I'm super excited because you and I share the love of blockchain. <laughs> and you know this idea that we can digitize stores of value. Um, even Schwab did it when they began to fractionalize shares, right? Make it, Mark used the word democratization, make those you know tech sector shares that are in the thousands of dollars accept, accessible to the everyday person because they're breaking them into trades. We can talk about fractionalization of, or digitization and fractionalization of assets across almost all categories today. Um, I sit on the board of a company called Rialto, which is taking and floating middle market debt, creating liquidity. Part of it is you know, in, the, in the core debt instrument and the other half is in a digital currency. I mean, and they're figure, FINRA regulated. It's a new world that financial services is influencing and the outcomes are super exciting. And the tools that underpin them um, have matured to where I think we think about them as institutional tools that can be embedded that just take us to the next level of where financial services can either serve or solve societal problems or bring in new, new and different um, customers. So it's a pretty great world out there, I have to say. Yeah, it is, it is good. I, I just love that idea of, of, you know, you think about a value chain, right? And you had to go to a place like a bank or you had to go to an insurance company to get the whole value chain and you couldn't take the piece you might want. Uh, and what the blockchain does a great job of, you know, what we think of as DeFi, right? That deconstruction of finance is always the way I like to think about it, will create all sorts of new markets. Um, and, you know, imagine the business models that get created if I take this piece of an insurance company and that piece of a bank and this piece of an asset manager and I reconfigure it in some way. And we're, you know, we're not gonna be there tomorrow, but, but you can start to see the beginnings of it, as you say, in digitization of assets and in thinking about you know, how information flows. Um, so it, it, we're in the early, early stages of, of watching what that will do. Yeah, Mark, some might argue it makes us a more secure industry because you've right. distributed bits and pieces of data out onto nodes. And the, and the complication of reconstituting all that information back where you might have fraud or you know, um, better ways actually maybe to track digital identity because you understand it um, and compare it and match it. Um, all, those, all those attributes of emerging technologies um, you know, have its basis in this decade of innovation. Yeah. It's, when you think about you know, somebody like KYC AML, right? You, you need to know your customer, yet you're a customer of 
12 organizations, 15 organizations, right? That you do business. Every one of them has to have a process to know you're really you, <laughs> which is crazy, right? As opposed to saying, as you say, here's my identity, you know, on this blockchain, it's the, the blockchain that's used for identity purposes. And therefore I'm good to go, right? Um, and, uh, and just think of the efficiency that would you know, create across, you know, just financial services, let alone <clears throat> other parts of, of uh, commerce. Uh, if we really knew we were a trusted party um, and without having to, to literally know each other, um, yeah. you know, as, as we did in the old days. So that's, uh, there's, there is a lot to come that's going to ultimately change you know, this environment significantly. And we should, we should send your named root bot out to do all the shank sanction screens. Because I had that responsibility at State Street for a set of products. And it oh, is a very funny. manual, historically <laughs> manual process to make sure people say they are who they are. But anyway, Manassi, sorry. We don't, Mark and I, as you can tell, we, we, we have a lot of time to talk to one another. So. This, is, this is great. You're making my job <laughs> easier. <laughs> I love it. Um, I have a couple more questions I'm going to go through, but you know, um, just a quick note for everyone watching, feel free to ask your questions in, in the Q&A section or in the chat. And in, in a couple, you know, five, 10 minutes or so, we will start taking audience questions. So definitely start pouring them in. Um, I wanted to talk about how all of this impacts the current uh, investment professionals, right? 86% uh, of the people today said that they don't feel like they were working in the fintech industry. Um, Want to hear more about, like, you know, ad advanced AI that Mark, you mentioned, uh, blockchain technology. Um, how, are, uh, how are all of these, like, new emerging technologies or even emerging companies affecting, you know, incumbents and affecting uh, investment professionals and what they should keep in mind as, as this industry kind of evolves and grows. Yeah, so do you want to start or you want? Mark, please. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I look at it as, as, you know, there's certainly things to be a little afraid of, right? It's a, if you're writing research reports and, and that's a big part of what you do, that will be done and is already being done today by advanced AI. Uh, you know, Google released, you know, CPT3, um, which is the advanced AI that they've built and essentially given away, which is remarkable. Uh, so we may, we may not like Google on one level, but we should love them on this level because they, they've done billions of dollars of research and given it away. That's going to create this incredible, um, you know, view of, of what you could do with the technology. It's not really uh, embedded in any startups that I've seen yet, but we've seen plenty of experiments with it. So, so when you think about your role, right, your role is to take information and make it make sense, right? Turn it into a trade, turn it into insights, whatever else it might be. Imagine how much easier that would be if the AI could bring you information that seems, you know, disconnected or not quite right, as opposed to, you know, this quarter's earnings uh, information and so forth, which is important to get out, but isn't really insightful. <clears throat> and so let the machinery do the less insightful part and then let the human brain do the thing that it does so well, which is make connections across areas that aren't obvious um, or make insights around areas that aren't obvious you know, for the company. Uh, I think that's what, a way to play it. I think another way to play it <clears throat> is to think about, you know, are there ways that I can get more involved in making this technology better? If I've been an analyst for many, many years and therefore I'm very good at what I do, <clears throat> can I go work with a uh, FinTech that allows me to translate that work into, you know, uh, again, a, it could be a bot of some type, and maybe they'll name it after you, <clears throat> but it allows you to, to, to think about, again, how do you, you find the outer edge of what it can do, and then, you know, put the human there. The way I describe it in the, in the advisory world, as an example, uh, having spent so many years in investment advice for retail consumers at LPL, um, is the best advisors don't spend any time on managing the money or explaining why they bought Apple versus buying something else, because that can all be done very easily in a report and doesn't really add a lot of value to our relationship. But the one thing I can do as a human is have empathy and sympathy for the person I'm working with. And the very best financial advisors understand what money means to me, right? And, and what, why I might be charitable, why I'm not charitable, why I want to pay for a child's education, why I might not want to pay for a child's education. These are deeply personal decisions. Um, and, and the best advisors get you to share that. Um, and you know, I, I don't know of AI that's going to be able to do that, right? I don't know of AI that can make that connection um, you know, with a human and really get to the core issue that they're facing. AI, though, can manage the money quite easily and do the reporting quite easily. So let's let it do that. Uh, and that, to me, is a good evolution of where one wants to spend their time 
if they're in the profession and thinking about you know, ways they could, they could be better at what they do. And frankly, it's more fun, right? It's much more interesting to open up these issues that are complex and difficult and, uh, and fun to sort out uh, in their own way than it is to, to worry again about what's this recent earnings report and, and that part of it. So I, I do think it, it, there's just a lot of opportunity for people to think about how this changes to the positive and how to be part of, of that action. Yeah, so I mean, like you said, AI can automate the processes and like the operational side of things, but the emotional and the relation side of things are still pretty critical. And that's something that AI will never be able to, hopefully, never be able to replace. Yeah, I don't, I think, you know, someone described to me that CPT3 is, is basically the difference between going from an ant's brain to an insect brain, right, to a, a more evolved insect, uh, let's call it a moth <clears throat> or a bee, right? And so, that, so we're talking about very small gradations of intelligence, but massive when it comes to thinking about it in terms of technology. Um, and so you can certainly use CPT3 to write, you know, a blog, right, or to even write a book uh, or to write music. <clears throat> and it does it reasonably well when you think about it, and it will only get better over time. Uh, uh, at what it does, and that's very low levels of intelligence, you know, programmed into the technology, and the intelligence will only grow over time. So we're talking about what happens in a decade from now, uh, for example, is one could imagine an insurance company that has 15 or 20 engineers in it, and that's it, <clears throat> because the bots did the claims, the bots did, you know, the analysis, um, and uh, did the investing and those things, uh, and you know, completely change it. Maybe ten years is too short, but but but, it, but it's uh, it's coming. You can't can't avoid that. Sarah. Yeah. Well, I do want to pick up Mark. I think you you said something that is so fascinating and one that I think we grapple with also on the institutional side, and that is the actual the intersection of technology with this emerging idea that individuals want to invest with their social value system. Yes. You know, they do, and we are required by DOL to have a reasonable rate of return on those investments, but one that also increasingly the individual or the endowment or, you know, the pension fund also wants the investor, the financial services professional, to really parse out and figure out how to match with the, with the moral set that we, we confront. And I do think Mark is spot on when he says that AI as a tool allows us through to, to mine through not only company data that might've been our first principle sort of problem that we went to to say, okay, your annual report tells me that you're, you know, you're striving to be carbon neutral, but really there's a second and third principle challenge here for the institutional investor. And that's to go down into the supply chain and understand and unpack where you may see challenges. And so I do think that technology um, as, a, as an ability to help ensure that you're achieving that goal that Mark, you just talked about yeah. rising empathy, but also changing investment mandates that actually don't show up so neatly packaged in a row in a column on a spreadsheet. And so how are we beginning to understand, collect, aggregate, synthesize data in a world that's really noisy, right? It doesn't always have ground truth. Well and, done. <laughs> right? Maybe less soon to be less noisy, I hope. But you know, I'm, I'm excited about the application, um, the ongoing application of these AI tools. And even to the point where we talked about where you have data sets being driven because financial services is being embedded in under other industries. And I just read last night some of the research of the inner, the partnership that's being formed, for instance, between Verizon and the deployment of 5G and AWS mm -hmm. to provide mobile edge computing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that mark, you know, edge computing at that level, talk about setting a building on fire. Yeah. Right? Do you know, <laughs> now you think about the fact I've got my phone sitting right here and I'll have the capacity to run. And Mark, I'll go back to your points because they were so well made. The intersection of deep computational capability at our fingertips at an extremely low cost. Yeah. And deploying it for decisions on the fly. I mean, it's a whole different world in financial services when you think about where we're heading. And think about what that means to work, right? You know, how cool would it be if I could, instead of, you know, of course we used to stand at 
tea stops and things. We we will get back to that. Um, and we have this wasted time. And you know, if, certainly, I find I don't like wasted time, and, and I'd like to keep my mind active. And I can play a game. That's fine. And, but I, you know, after a while, find that just a little much. And so, imagine with that kind of computing power, what I could do in ten or fifteen minutes mm -hmm. that I really have to kind of sit down or or be interactive with my laptop today. Um, you know, to, to be able to do those things, some financial analysis, some insights, whatever else it might be, that are again uniquely human. <clears throat> and and wouldn't it be cool if you could deliver work to me um, at that sort of micro size, and you could pay me in micro payments, right? Using the blockchain to pay me for you know what would be pennies in the dollar or whatever for that that work, um, because it's appropriate to the time I'm spending. So it it just it, it, all these things are enablers, right? To, to fantastic change. That very creative humans will will do. I'm sometimes asked the question, "What's what's a future startup look like?" And I'm like, "I haven't a clue. <laughs> like, like, I don't know." But the one thing I do know is when you get the kind of power of technology, Sarah, you just described, and you get you know blockchain even more robust as it is today, uh, and you get um, you know this deconstruction of the value chain. You someone's going to be very intelligent and in reshaping um, you know those activities to something that fits better. With the way that we like to receive and use information. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. I think that's right. And I think it's also going to intersect with other parts of our life. Yeah. Um, our financial well-being is so interchanged with you know the decisions, Mark, you're talking about that individuals right. make, but I think about health outcomes. Um, I mean, there, there's really this distributed sense of what we can do if we have a much more holistic view um, of decisioning and information about the individual. So. We have a, a company on the same theme of advanced AI, a company called Clerky that we put in a portfolio for Fund One. Just uh, we did it during COVID, which is its own its own kettle of fish. <laughs> but but the, the part that was interesting about it is that they have used advanced AI to help someone with essentially a thin credit file, you know, create behavioral change, and they're using the the bot to deliver information. So I've hooked up my checking account. Um, and my credit card, and you can now see my spending habits, and and it basically doesn't nag you, but but it reminds you that you're trying to to improve your credit score, and therefore you might want to take actions that are different. Um, and you can deliver that in real time, basically as it's happening. So I just went into Starbucks for the 14th time, and therefore I can get a reminder that says, you know, this probably isn't the best use of uh, money, given that you have a goal to buy a house or you know whatever it is you're doing. Uh, they just crossed a million users. Um, and a million dollars of ARR, and they launched in July, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, they have they have less than I think I want to say it's ten people, but it may be more. So in terms of employees, um, and so um, you know, imagine that, right? As they keep climbing, you know, the number of, of uh, people they can help um, and, uh, and get them. They'll, they will eventually get them to a marketplace where there needs to be a human who interacts with the consumer <clears throat> to you know help with the, the if you will the last mile. Uh, of that advice, similar to what we're talking about in terms of asset-based advice. Um, and there certainly are situations where the credit situation or the asset situation is incredibly complex um, and the technology can only take you so far, right? Um, you know, it, 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 it's not meant to be everything for everybody. It's meant to be a way of really getting rid of as much of the mundane work as possible to focus on the really interesting and complex cases. But Mark, use that example where you said, like, what does the insurance agency look like in the future? Right. Well, maybe right. the insurance agency uses Clarky because if it's measuring you trying to amend your financial behavior, it also might be saying, okay, you not only didn't buy 15 lattes this week. I mean, not that I ever did that. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> but, right? yeah. but your health outcomes, you're, not, you're less likely to get right. heart disease. So I'm yeah. going to also dynamically price your health insurance. Yeah. Exactly. I'm going to know you, right? And so that idea, that holistic vision of what um, of what the technology and the data lets us understand has implications for how we do our jobs as financial services executives mm. and what we envision. No, and absolutely. I'd probably reprice all our insurance companies if, if I had Clarky and it was telling me, don't turn left to Starbucks, turn right. Yeah. Anyway. Well, it's, and it, as you see it in driverless technology, right? It's really reducing risk in a significant way. You see it in a little, you know, uh, device you can put in your car or you can now put on your smartphone that you know, lets you know how your driving habits are. I, I've always turned those away, I must admit, <laughs> but, but I may not be able to avoid them in the future. Um, and, uh, and that then does price, you know, price risk. Uh, I remember when I first moved to Boston about 25 years ago and I used a turn signal and I had a good friend in the car with me who said, you clearly are not from here. <laughs> right? but, but imagine if 
what happened was is it, it starts to really you know be more helpful in terms of it. So I, I was reflecting on a, a car <clears throat> that recently that I was in with my wife Julia, and the car made me put on my turn signal in order to change lanes. <clears throat> and I was laughing and saying, "Remember when we first moved here? This this you we I." Yeah. Had to, as a human, remember to do it, and now the car makes me do it. Right? If I want to do that without the wobbly tire problem, um, and that's not in every car, and it's it's not meant to be a statement about the car I drive. It's meant to be about the fact that technology is incredibly helpful in reducing risk, um, and it's incredibly helpful in transferring that risk the appropriate way and paying for it appropriately. Um, and and I, I, I see a, a comment from somebody who calls all that big brother, and I, I'm afraid that's right. I mean, in a world where every camera is, you, you can see somebody, I'm afraid we're, we're well beyond uh, the privacy that we all have enjoyed you know, growing up. Um, and then we're gonna have to get used to how to control these devices and control information in a way uh, you know, that allows us to feel comfortable that, that these things help us advance our capabilities, but don't control our lives, right, in a, in a negative way. Yeah, I mean, I think privacy is definitely a big concern, but what makes me kind of um, happy is to see that that's, you know, for, at the forefront of the conversation. When we are talking about this technology, we immediately start thinking about how our data is being used, monitored, and at least in the blockchain space, you know, people who are building that technology are pretty aware of the implications of privacy. But Sarah, you brought up the point of composability in a way, right? Building on one tech stack and like adding additional features and like just creating this like, uh, you know, huge um, application that does like multiple things. Um, and that's a core component of DeFi that Mark, you alluded to decentralized finances, as we call it. Um, and I know you might, you both might disagree on this, but I wanna hear from both of you, you know, when do you think we'll be fully in a fully decentralized financial system? I think it's going to be a while. So I, I think it's going to be, you know, at least a decade before we start to see it really start to reconfigure in significant ways. So I, I tend to be a, a whatever that is, you know, a, a latest. <laughs> I'm, I'm earlier. I think we're, we're well in our way. I think even this week we saw the announcement, for instance, that Algorand, um, really fabulous uh, Cambridge, MIT spin out Cambridge based company, um, will digitize the Canadian coin. Um, and actually make it a store of value. Yeah. And so, you know, those are, those are very substantial um, efforts that leapfrog what has historically held us back from a decentralized financial services system. So Mark and I will agree to disagree on the pace in which <laughs> we'll see, we'll see DeFi happen. But Manasseh, I would encourage, I think it is an important area of study for anyone who's in, um, in the institutional asset manager or retail asset manager space, because it, it does hold the, I don't know use the word opportunity, but perhaps the means in which um, we will see a completely different way that financial services works. Um, it will no longer be a closed loop. It will be open. Um, and well, you can, and, and I think what we do agree is that, is that that all this is good, right? And and, and the pacing is a question of of how long do you get adoption, and and I think some of the regulation needs to be caught up as well. Um, you know, you see some of that happening, for example, in privacy of data that that is clearly very far behind the realities of data. Um, and and I think here I worry a little bit about you know the understanding. Um, you know, the right controls in a good way that need to be put in place, you know, for how DeFi will work, you know, that's there. And you saw it in crypto, right? It, it, at first, you know, ICOs bloom and we think that there's a new way to raise money that don't have, you know, that isn't under the SEC regulatory body and it turns out it is, right, in the U.S. Um, and suddenly the world changes uh, back again. So it, it is important that, that, you know, that regulatory piece goes along with it. Um, and we do understand, you know, the, the impact of these. I've always thought there should be kind of a rating system around, you know, algorithms and, and we can't, we're humans and we design algorithms. So by definition, we design bias in them. You can't mm -hmm. avoid it. Mm -hmm. But the question is, can you do work to, you know, take bias out or at least check bias uh, and be able to report back? And I, I've, I've spent a little bit of time with regulators in the last two or three years. Uh, I work with FINRA on a committee they do around FinTech and spend some time with the SEC saying, you've got to think about you know, how could you introduce uh, effectively a, a, a annual or biannual review of the algorithms that are important to credit decisions or important to allocation of asset decisions uh, in order to, to be able to do it 
you know, the right way and, and understand the bias that may be evolving in it. Uh, it was on the board of Citizens Bank for many years, for six years. And when they were starting to build algorithms for credit decisions, said, you, you've got to go ahead and start doing a risk management exercise of understanding the outcome of those in order to make sure you're not introducing a bias that in the light of day, you know, causes a real problem for, for people. So there's, there's a lot to do, which is why I put more time on it. Yeah, but you, you raise a really important issue, one that I hope we can actually touch on, and that is the potential for bias that sets us back, all these innovative ideas, the application of AI and the coding, um, it, it, you know, if there's bias in those um, outcomes, it's going to set us back years in the industry. We've worked so hard to get, you know, far and, and be blind to certain characteristics and have no business being in a credit decision, for instance. And one thing I can say is just being in the entrepreneurial community, we're seeing the rise of self-governance in the fintech entrepreneurs. And I yeah, think, good the, point. right, a great and high degree of maturity and self-awareness um, that, I, that I hope continues to persist, but it's an important point for all of us. Well, and all this is about change, right? It's, and it's the human's ability to withstand change. And as humans, we all have different, you know, uh, you know, desires around the pace of change we want. I've always personally, and I, Sarah, I know you well enough to know you're the same as we like change, right? Like bring it on, the faster, yeah. the better. Um, and, uh, and that's a big part of it. And, and I noticed a question about a SPAC that I launched recently in the fintech space yeah. called Left Terrace. Uh, it, it's called that because it's the word for freedom, but it, everybody in the group with save one is left-handed, which is an unusual <laughs> grouping of people to say the least. <laughs> but, but SPACs are a funny thing, right? They, they need to professionalize. And one of the things that, that we know is true is SPACs launched by operators Operators, which all eight of us in the left terrace back were former CEOs, CFOs, GCs, um, directors of public companies and, and operated in, in financial services. And we know that those based on a McKinsey study have much better return characteristics is presumably we know more of what to look for uh, in fintech land in our case or in operating companies that can go public. Um, the structure is also a, a get rich quick scheme, which is which I, I say very openly, not because I, I am going to use it for that, but because we're actually say to, to companies we talk to, we're not in this to do that. We want to align incentives, right, that you're more valuable two years out as a public company than you are on the day you go public. And so I think that what you'll see are SPACs as a tool of finance, right, and as a tool of bringing these changes further along. Um, you know, they can be done in a way that, that really helps make it cost effective and makes it interesting for a, a company who wants to get out there. And interesting enough, we've had a number of companies talk to us that are in the crypto space. Uh, they're crypto miners, uh, crypto institutional custodians. So you're starting to see emerge a sector that isn't in the public markets today and soon will be, um, either through SPACs or through their own work. And I, that, to me, it's just fascinating to see companies are kind of ready, right, to, to get out there and use the public markets as they should be um, you know, for a good source of capital uh, and allow uh, you know, consumers and, and investors to have a chance to, to see you know, what Sarah and I see a lot in, in early stage and later stage companies. Um. I, I can continue asking questions for another hour or so, but I'm going to let, um, you know, people in the audience ask them. So I'm going to pick a couple. I think, you, you know, this back one, you already answered, Mark. So thank you for that. But there's another one from Edwin that says, um, any firms working on automating process to bring behavioral finance uh, insight to client advisor relationship? Um, anything more on like the human part? Um, are you seeing any... Uh, firms that are working in that space. Sarah, I think I think in Mass Challenge they had Cognacore that yeah. is doing. It's not quite that, but it's it's getting closer. It's using you know a, a way of bringing automation to uh, the processes for advisors, um, which include understanding you know what uh, you know, emotional needs are there. Uh, there's a firm out of Switzerland whose name at the moment eludes me, but but hasn't had a lot of traction in the U.S. market that actually takes a video feed like this one and, and flashes images to you and then you react to them, right? You can't help your reaction, it's the human condition. And then based on that, we'll be able to, to plot kind of are you a worrier, not a worrier, optimistic, all the different characteristics that are there to help better refine the way that the advisor works with you. It feels a little creepy to me, to be honest, right? Um, and so I don't, I'm not wild about that idea, but I, but I like the idea that people are trying to, to create ways to help better arm the advisor. What I haven't seen, I'd love to find, 
is somebody who works with advisors to help them with those skills, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you know, teaches them a little bit of psychology 101 uh, and ways to really help engage with clients. I, we haven't seen that as a as a entity, but it should exist uh, and should be part of what's there um, as, as a way of thinking about that space. Yeah, I was uh, Park, just making sure I had the right name too before I called it out, but I followed with great interest a Baltimore-based um, startup called Fawcett Wealth. Um, yeah, and they're you print a faucet and and they actually approach it in a with a hybrid solution they are not fully digitizing the assessment of behavioral um, ticks or tells or the uh, but they're but they're blending it with it with very much a sophisticated ux interface but also bringing in the individual but using it to inform i think mark much like you talked about adding value to the advisor's day yeah. so there are yeah i definitely think there's some efforts out there that um, don't order on the creepy are actually very thoughtful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's good. That's a good one. I forgot about that. But the, the uh, it, I mean, it tells everybody who's on the, the call today, there is a lot to do in, in financial services. Uh, and so if you're the least bit inclined to be entrepreneurial um, or be part of a team that's entrepreneurial in the space, there's plenty of opportunity um, and plenty of ways to translate your experience into that world. Effectively, my career was pretty standard asset management, wealth management play. And then what fascinated me was this unusual time that we're in and being able to set up a venture firm, which by itself is entrepreneurial, and then, you know, to support entrepreneurs in this phase. And, I, and for me, it's been incredibly enlightening. Um, and I've learned very quickly that some of my experiences are the least bit relevant and, and, and therefore, you know, good for me for having it, but doesn't matter. Um, and then, and some of it is quite helpful. Um, and, and, you know, part of the fun of it all uh, that, that, you know, the group here might enjoy is, you know, what part can I add to that team? And you can add a lot um, because you have an experience that's about understanding, you know, where value is created, how value is created, thinking about, you know, the sources of people's issues and angst within, you know, wealth management, for example. These are all areas that fintechs, you know, deal with in different ways. Um, and is a good way to get involved, even as an advisor to a company without necessarily having to leave, you know, the day job. Yeah, Mark, I think you just said something that we should point out is, you know, fintech is the second largest uh, category for venture capital attraction, right? It's going to be, it's estimated to be $300 billion next year. It's certainly kind of, Mark, you could share better, um, more astutely, but I don't think it, it, it slowed a little in the beginning of the pandemic, but it's back to normal um, levels. And um, I think that it's attracting so much capital is because we not only are seeing the maturation of these technologies, but the mat maturation of the individuals who are fintech entrepreneurs, who yep. are building these great firms, they are professionals. Um, and so it's used to be a lot of tech and a little bit of fin. And now what I think particularly what we see on the East Coast is a lot of fin coming in and building just tremendous tech that's based on Mark, exactly what you said, experiences. So it's well, I think professionals are welcomed um, in this in this particular, yeah, area. I, a little joke that Sarah's heard a hundred times, so I'm sorry for this, but but you, you do need a little gray hair, right? That, that, it, that some of the problems yeah. in financial services are really deeply embedded and you have to have known them to come solve them. As you know, a lot of consumer, you know, internet companies in particular, and even a lot of consumer fintechs are a problem someone had. And then they were inspired to go and create a solution from an entrepreneurial standpoint, nothing wrong with that. Um, but that's somewhat limiting, right? In terms of, of knowing the, the deeply embedded issues. And one of the things that's been fun at Vestigo is we look at the wave of about 2000 companies we looked at to get to the 23 we've invested in. You can see the difference over time of where it's turning more and more to people who are deeply inside and understand the problem um, and, uh, and, and therefore can, can bring a solution to it. Um, I think we can take one last question, but before we do take that question, um, you know, just want to hear from the audience today, what aspect of FinTech would you like to see additional programming around? Um, you know, today's session was meant to be an overview where Mark and Sarah touched on a lot of different topics and each of them can be a session in themselves and you know, hopefully we'll have them back again to dive deeper on those topics, but definitely, um, you know, feel free to chime in in the chat. Uh, what specific you know, aspects of this conversation you would you like to see additional programming around? Um, and with that, uh, while people chime in in the chat, Mark and Sarah, for you, what are the best resources for 
uh, this group of people to help understand and also follow the fintech area and the trends that are happening in the space. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a local plug and like you probably can breathe it, broaden it to the global, but we do have a really active FinTech community in the Boston area. We have about 4,500 individuals who self-identify as wanting to know more about FinTech or FinTech entrepreneurs. Um, they, we organize ourselves through actually a meetup. If you haven't done the meetup websites, it's the Boston FinTech meetup. We're very creative over here. Um, but we do try to bring um, to bear every month really also some rich and rigorous programming of issues that are very much germane across the entire fintech landscape. Um, but would encourage you, it's, it's free, it's fun, it's super collegial. It's one repeatable source of new information. Um, obviously thank you CFA Society for letting us talk about fintech but I think in addition we have um, we have Boston Fintech Week um, we're often honored that Mark uh, speaks um, and that brings again another about 4,000 people um, into various sessions across the week and so there's lots of ways Manassi I would tell you for this group if they just kind of google mass fintech or Boston fintech you begin to see these resources around programming um, that are dynamic and, and I think easy to access. Yeah, I, I would just add that, that you've got you know, Mass Challenge, Fintech Sandbox, MIT's Fintech Club um, are, are my three go-tos when, when I, I think about the space. Um, and what's nice about it, if you're, if you're just in sort of exploration mode, which I, I take a little bit from some of the questions that have been asked, I just wanna learn more. It's just fun to go to some of the events. You meet some incredible people. Um, you get a sense of just the wide ranging um, ideas that are out there um, from the fintechs and the incredible support that's you know here in our own backyard, so to speak. Obviously, many of these things are virtual and, and uh, they'll, they'll kind of restart in the fall, I suspect, of 2021. 20, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but there's plenty to look at online that, that gives you that information as well. Um, and, and let you, you know, stay attuned to what's happening that I think can be helpful. Um, you know, for me, it's, it's, the, it's the intersection of you know, what is financial services doing with the advent of super advanced technology and the energy of an entrepreneur uh, and the entrepreneurial team that's there that really creates an interesting mix of, of ideas. Not everything works out, right? It's, it's uh, unfortunately, in the early stage investing, there's a you know, high possibility of, of the company not making it, uh, but, but you still learn something in, in the not making of it. And you, know, you grow uh, as an individual, even if it turns out not to have been the right idea, it often leads to you know, a pivot to something that is uh, very effective. Yeah, and Mark, while you're saying that, it reminds me to the growth. Um, Manassi, we'd be remiss if we didn't call out your work in women in blockchain. So I think there is this sort of, you know, category of which there's a there's a good place to learn too. So thank you, Manassi, for what you're doing too. Appreciate it, Anna. Thank you so much for the shout out. And I think that's a great note to end today's session. I really appreciate both of your time and the insights that you provided. I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone on this call today learned a lot. Um, really, really appreciate all of the you know, highlights and learnings from the past sort of decades of your experience. Um, <laughs> if people were to connect with you, what's the best way? How do they reach out after this conversation? Yeah, for, for me, uh, best way is through M. Cassidy, and Cassidy spelled a little strangely, C-A-S-A-D-Y, uh, at vestigoventures.com, you know, V-E-S-T-I-G-O ventures.com. And I, I'll take direct messages via LinkedIn. That's a Very more good. Good. organized place. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Very smart. Well, either that or it's always one step ahead yeah. of me, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm learning a new trick. <laughs> I'm going to pass it on to Gary or Caitlin if they have any final closing remarks. But again, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Manasi. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Uh, this will be the last program uh, of this calendar year. So we wish all of you to have a safe uh, and wonderful holiday season. And we will see you next year. Thank you and take care. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.